FGM involves the partial or total removal of the external female genital organs for cultural or other non-therapeutic reasons. The practice is medically unnecessary, it's extremely painful and can have serious health consequences, both at the time when the mutilation is carried out and in later life. It is considered to be a normal cultural practice in many communities in the world and some of these cultures consider the practice to be of health benefit to the woman. Some consider it to be inappropriate for a woman to be married without the procedure having been carried out prior to the marriage taking place. In the UK, the practice of female genital mutilation is illegal and is considered to be child abuse. The most likely time for FGM to be performed is between the ages of 13 to 18 years. However, the procedure may be carried out when the child is newborn, during childhood or adolescence, just before marriage or during the first pregnancy. Reinfibulation may occur after a birth occurs. In the short term, FGM can cause health problems such as hemorrhage, wound infections including contracting bloodborne viruses such as hepatitis B and C and HIV, urinary retention, fractures as a result of restraint of the woman, severe pain, emotional and psychological shock and death. Long-term health outcomes may be chronic vaginal and pelvic inflammatory disease, menstruation difficulties, chronic urine infections, infertility due to chronic infection, complications in pregnancy, and emotional and mental ill health. How is FGM performed? FGM is performed within the practicing communities, usually by female elders. It is legal for practitioners to perform this procedure in the UK, although there is evidence that the procedure is performed informally. There is some evidence that cutters, which is a term used to describe the people who undertake the procedure, are brought from other countries to perform the procedure. FGM is carried out using a number of locally produced cutting tools. There is usually no anaesthesia and no infection control measures undertaken. There are mainly four types of FGM. Type 1 is a clitoridectomy, seen to be the, most, the least severe of the mutilations. This involves partial or total removal of the clitoris and or the prepuce, which is the fold of skin around the clitoris. Type 2 is excision and this involves partial or total removal of the clitoris and the labia minora. Type 3 felt to be the most serious of the um, mutilations is known as infibulation and this is narrowing of the vaginal opening through the creation of a covering seal. This is formed by cutting or repositioning the inner or outer labia with or without removal of the clitoris. There's also a fourth category and that relates mainly to other forms of um, mutilation and that may be pricking, piercing of the genital area, incising, scraping or cauterizing of, of the genital area. Where in the world does FGM occur? FGM occurs in many areas of the world most girls who have been identified, however, 
have been from some countries in Africa and Middle East. The UNICEF data identified that countries such as Somalia have rates as high as 98% of women who have undergone the procedure, whereas Kenya has rates of 0.6%. Other countries, such as India and Pakistan, are recognised as having areas where FGM is practised. Some cultures believe that the practice of FGM is associated with the practice of Islam. However, Islamic leaders have publicly condemned FGM and have issued statements that this is contrary to the practice of Islam. What is the legal status of FGM in the UK? I've already mentioned that the practice of FGM is illegal in the UK and has been since 1985. The law was further updated in 2003. This includes carrying out of the procedure by medically qualified practitioners. The Department of Health have published some signs which may alert health practitioners that FGM has already occurred or may be about to occur. For FGM which may have already occurred, the following signs may be present. A girl or woman having difficulty walking, sitting or standing. A girl or woman spending longer than normal in the bathroom or toilet due to having difficulties urinating. A girl may spend long periods of time away from the classroom during the day with bladder or menstrual problems. There may be frequent urinary tract infections reported or menstrual problems or a prolonged absence with noticeable behaviour changes on the girl's return. Or there may be reluctance to undergo medical examination. For signs that FGM may be about, about to occur, the following signs may be present. Prolonged or repeated absences from school or college. Family attending for travel vaccinations who may be having an extended holiday and the girl or woman talks about a special celebration. Or other are female children born to women who are known to have had FGM procedure carried out historically. So what is the UK guideline to healthcare professionals regarding FGM? In March of this year, 2015, the Department of Health published its guidance for health practitioners for FGM. Under the Serious Crime Act of 2015, it is now a mandatory requirement for health practitioners to report all actual cases of FGM in a child under the age of 18 years. Practitioners are also required to consider the risk of harm to any female children born to a woman who is known to have had the procedure carried out. The Department of Health is also considering requirements for information to be shared about women who have undergone the procedure in child health records of their female children. Um, there, is no, there is still a debate around that matter, um, but further updates will be coming for that. Acute healthcare settings are also required to send monthly data sets to Public Health England of the numbers of women who have been identified as having undergone FGM so that the extent of this issue in the UK can be ascertained. There will be a requirement for GP practices to also submit such information from October 2015. So where can individuals get help if concerned? Well, FGM is considered to be child abuse. 
and so guidance can be sought from health organisations own safeguarding teams and in addition referral to children's social care and police may be required. There is also clear guidance for health staff on the NHS Choices and the local Safeguarding Children Board's websites and from the Department of Health's own guidance.